Hi, good evening. Good evening. How are you all? I hope all of you are doing well and all of you are enjoying the journey of learning culture and uh, folklore studies, right? And uh, welcome to lecture four or podcast four of folklore and culture studies. I am enjoying this journey and uh, I hope you are enjoying this journey as well. And uh, let's, you know, like in every podcast or episode, I, I I give you the purpose, right? The purpose of me sharing this with you guys is I love, I'm a student of uh, folklore and culture studies. This subject attracts me, um, right? And which is why I'm learning the subject and, and, and I'm sharing this knowledge with you. So if you're a student of culture studies, I hope these podcasts or videos help you in some way or the other. And even if you're not a student, but you know, but you are an enthusiast about uh, culture and folklore studies, I think these podcasts or videos would be some source of information and could be helpful as well. Right. So without much ado, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Abhilash. I'm a student of folklore and culture studies. And welcome again to podcast four or, or episode four of uh, folklore and culture studies. Let's do a quick recap so far. So far, we've covered, um, we've covered, uh, let me quickly check my notes. We've covered the history the history of folklore, we've covered the definition of folklore, we've covered functions, different aspects, the functional aspects of folklore. And today we shall cover genres. And trust me, while I was doing the research, where while I studied, um, you know, for this episode, today's podcast or episode is some is very close to my heart right and there is a particular reason behind it because all these while you know we spoke about the definition functional functions right those those are elements or opinions of different scholars but today in genres we will talk about things um, that that we I'm sure we would have physically seen them. We would talk about arts. We would talk about craft. We would talk about folk dance. Wow! And as I speak, share this with you, it runs chills down my spine, right? And and I hope I'm you know able to transfer the same energy, uh, you know, to you all as well. All right. So let's do a quick progress check we are i'm i'm following the ignu masters uh, curriculum right now we are in the first you know in the section called folklore and culture conceptual perspectives within which we have block 1 folklore issues and methods and then we have unit 1 uh, where we've already covered the definition we've covered history we've covered the function and today we will cover genres as well right and by today would be the last um, episode or, or podcast for the unit one. And the next session will start all fresh with a separate section. All right. So without much ado, let's quickly get started. All right. Like I have already... Uh, told you guys we're done with the definition we're done with the function today we're going to cover genres all right let's now this is one more disclaimer that what i'm going to do and uh, is i'm going to read verbatim from the notes and uh, and i'm going to simplify the whole whole concept for you right and that's that is one of the reasons why uh, what's and that's that's should be a factor for you guys to listen to these podcasts or videos all right so let's quickly get started so genres it is generally accepted that folk life embraces the whole panorama of human life and traditional culture that includes traditional art and craft as well as oral culture the various genres of folk culture can be divided into four main headings so today we will delve deep into these four headings that we have. We will start with the oral literature, then move on to material culture, and then social folk custom and performing folk arts. All right. So let's start with the oral literature. 
under this category are spoken, sung, or merely voiced forms of verbal communications that show some repeated behavior. This is sometimes defined as verbal or communicative arts as well, right? So let's, uh, oral, right? It means uh, something that we speak, we have, where we use mouth, right? So let's start. The subcategories in oral literature, let's start with oral narratives, stories, and tales. This is interesting. I... I doubt if there's anyone who hasn't heard any folk tale or story as we are growing up, right? Even now, we listen to stories as well. Um, all right. So the need to tell a story and the need to listen to it is ageless. This is exactly what I said, right? Not just uh, while we were kids, but even now, right? Stories, listening to stories is ageless. Folk narratives encompasses all genres of lit oral literature. It covers all, all categories. The tale provides a sense of fantasy to the listener, right? Although, although stories where we have elements of uh, fantasy, for example, you know, the Sindbad was one of the stories that I can think of. The Arabian Tales, right? Ali Baba Charlie's Shore. Uh, you know, and other stories, right? The Panchatantra. How can I miss Panchatantra, right? That is probably one of the most famous, uh, you know, stories, uh, story series, which we may have listened to as, as growing up, right? So folk narratives encompass all genres of oral literature. The tale provides a sense of fantasy to the listener. Individual expansion and urbanization has also floated a large number of uh, tales, right? These tales can be fictitious, historical, revered, or ridiculed treatments and plots. So we, you know, we have fictitious characters, you know, there could be historical characters as well. There could be stories, you know, where we revere, revered is where we have a lot of respect for people or heroic tales as well. A lot of um, stories ridiculed as well, right? Ridicules are joke, jokes or, you know, made fun upon. So there are different plots of these oral narratives or stories. Could be serious ones, could be, you know, something which is humorous, could be uh, fictitious, could be historical, etc. The characters may be mortal or divine. Mortal is, you know, something um, um, living, living right which means the characters uh human characters or divine characters could be your um, you know stories of gods or supernatural or human as well the panchatantra stories from india are very popular folk narratives right we've already sp spoken about that that is I, I doubt if there's anyone who doesn't know about panch uh, panchatantra Right. So the first category of oral literature is oral narratives, stories and tales. Moving on, the second category under the oral uh, folklore is the folk poetry. This can be differentiated from narrative in the manner of its transmission. Sometimes they do not concentrate on a single poem on its own. Oral epics come under this, this group. Uh, poetry is often repetitive, dramatic, and exaggerated, right? It's repetitive. A lot of, you know, perhaps because of the rhyme or the rhythm it has, it becomes repetitive. It is dramatic and exaggerated is, you know, larger than life, right? Uh, this often deals with materials of dramatic local significance, right? Generally, folk poetry has uh, materials of local uh, significance, right? On the other hand, um, you know, your other uh, poetries that we have, for example, the, you know, epics on the other hand, epics, right, epics on the other hand, are poems that are highly ornamental, dealing with the adventures of extraordinary people. They can be heroic, romantic, and historic. The Mahabharata and Ramayana are two major epics of our country, right? So this is the difference. So folk poetry, again, one, one particular uh, character can be it may have local dramatic significance and we and the other category in poetry are epics which are larger than life and um, it does it does not stick to a particular region right few uh, the epics mentioned for example Mahabharata and Ramayana are relevant to any part of the country that you belong to 
So that's about folk poetry. And then we have proverbs. This can be easily observed and collected and they have been a part of our everyday verbal recourses, right? We use proverbs every now and then and perhaps in every situation of life, we may have um, you know, a proverb associated with it. These are short, witty expressions uh, and arise as a part of our daily dis uh, discourse as well as in highly structured situations like education as well. So not just in our daily life, also in situations, uh, also in education, which is a highly structured situation, we do come across uh, proverbs, right? For example, the saying, uh, from the frying pan into the fire, right? This is an interesting one. What does it mean? It means from, from bad to worse, right? So uh, his, his, uh, his decision, to give you an example, his decision is, would take him from a fire uh, from a frying pan to fire, which means he's taken a bad decision and uh, that's going to take him from bad to worse, right? So that's an example. They often take a personal circumstance and embody it in a witty form. So generally, proverbs are you know not used in the context of a group, right? This is at a one-on-one -on -one level, and um, you know it 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 has elements of wit in it, right? So those are examples of proverbs and riddles. Riddles, right? There are so many riddles we, we would have uh, come across. So riddles are what? Riddles are questions or sort of puzzles. Riddles are questions that are framed with the purpose of confusing or testing the wits of those who do not know the answers. Usually, they have confusing descriptions and often describe a scene as well, right? Now, for you, we have an example here. If you speak, the example for riddle, if you speak its name, you break it. What is it? Let me repeat. If you speak its name, you break it. What is it? Now, this is something I'm not going to answer, although I do know the answer. But I want you guys, if you're listening to these podcasts or this video lecture, I want you guys to answer this in the form of a comment, all right? If you find this interesting. So let me repeat it one more time. If you speak its name, you break it. What is it? <laughs> uh, I hope that's an interesting one. Interesting little for you all. Now, moving on, one more aspect of the oral uh, oral folklore is the folk speech. This is highly informal, informal way of talking that is learned by linguistic acculturation and by observing language patterns from one, one's families, friends, and associates. Often, one describes this as dialect. These are sub. These are often subject to regional, class, and community peculiarities. It is distinguished from cultivated and common speech through its pronunciation. In simple words, what it means is, right, for instance, let's say, you know, you belong to a particular state in India. Within that, but you know, that state, we have different accents, different dialects, right? Um, in Hindi, they say that har sokadam mein Bhasha change with you. Bhasha change, you know, hone ka matlab here in this case is the dialect changes, right? Every hundred meters. That's a very common saying. Not in the most literal sense, but yes, that, that's true to a lot of sense, uh, to, a, to a lot of extent, right? And how does it change? Because there are a lot of factors which influence the change. For example, one of the factor could be region. One of the factor could be class. One of the factor could be community right all of these uh, or family friends and associates as well right so all these factors influence the change and therefore every you know uh, area we have a different dialect even though the common the language is common but the dialect could uh, differ which is uh, you know which is an example of folk speech so that's about the oral literature that we have that was the first category in, in genres the second category is material culture. This is super interesting. Now, in direct contrast to the oral folklore is the physical folk life that can be described as material culture. 
This responds to the techniques transmitted across generations and our processes that are handmade fall under this group. Some of its important subgenres are as described. So in other words, the material culture is very different from the, the oral folk literature that we have, right? And in you know, to categorize the, the note says that it's very simple. Anything that is handmade, right, falls under this category. So while we go through um, you know, the further lecture, try and think of few uh, few material culture, those are handmade. I'm sure you have already come across a few answers. So number one is crafts that we have. Any item having artistic or utilitarian functions. Utilitarian function is something that can be used. It which something which has a utility or use, right? Any any item having artistic, anything which can be used uh, as a form of art to decorate, right? Or it which can be used, that is handmade, and has been passed down by tradition. Come under arts. That's how you define. Sorry, crafts. That's how you define crafts. This is different from art and occupation. It has immense aesthetic appeal and requires workmanship, right? It has immense aesthetic appeal, which means that it looks great or it has a different appeal to it. It's not common, it's uncommon, that's what it means. And it requires workmanship, which means not everybody can make it, right? For example, pottery can be example of that, right? Not everyone can make it. It, it requires some uh, specific uh, skills, right? Some of the examples that I've collated is the Madhubani art that we have from Bihar, the Patta Chitra that we have from Odisha, Fulkari, Dokra, the Pashmina shawl. These could be examples of crafts that we have. All right. And uh, let's move on to art. How do we define or how different is, uh, you know, art from craft? Let's try and understand right art right from school right art and craft grow hand in hand but we'll try and find a differentiation here any object that gives some pleasure and serves some practical social or economic purpose can be called as folk art all right let me repeat any object that gives some pleasure something which is good about it right uh, also serves some practical Right, which 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 can be used, uh, social or economic purpose. Economic could mean right th things that can be sold. There's a there's a you know monetary transaction in what people sell, other people buy. Right, that can be called as folk art. It should be noted here that if the pleasure giving giving function predominates, then the artifact is called art. Right. So, and if a practical function predominates, it is called as craft. This is the difference here. Right. Let me repeat. It should be noted that if the pleasure giving function predominates, so something which gives pleasure, for, for example, you like it or it, it has an aesthetic appeal, it looks good to the naked eyes, right? Or you use it. Uh, to decorate the house. It may not have a practical purpose, but you know, it gives a pleasure. Things like these are called as art or this artifact is called as art. On the other hand, if the practical function predominates, which means perhaps, um, you know, it's beautiful, but it, it's the, the, the practical function of using it, right? Um, anything that can be used, the practical function predominates. It is called as craft. I hope I was able to uh, demarcate a clear difference between art and craft here. The main purpose is aesthetic appeal, like we've already established. Aesthetic is something you know that looks uh, the the physical characteristics. This object can be more popular and will not be subject to will not be subject to rapidly changing fa uh, fashions. So generally, you'll not find a lot of, um, you know, change in these kind of um, art. So that's that. We've already established crafts, arts, and moving on, we'll talk about folk architecture. This can be traditional. This can, this can be said to be traditional architecture. It is concerned with all traditional aspects of building, 
right? The shapes, sizes, and its layouts, such as barns and sheds, the material used and the tools and techniques of the building, the sites chosen and the placement of these various buildings, the uses and functionality of such buildings. So, those, you know, at times you may have noticed that, you know, you go to a particular place and uh, you would find a difference, right? When I say difference, it would be very different from, from uh, the houses or the buildings of today's day and age, particularly if you go to old cities, right? Uh, I mean, most cities have a old, old portion and, uh, uh, you know, a, a newer side of the town as well. So you would find these folk architecture, especially in the older south sides of the cities or older sides of the town where uh, there are glimpses of traditional architecture, right? Most of the houses would be built in a particular, um, um, particular architecture, the... You know, the materials used could be different from region to region as well. That, you know, bases the availability of the product. That could be one of the reasons, right? And the sites chosen and the placements of those buildings, the uses and uh, functionality of such buildings as well. I mean, as we speak, I, you know, I think of um, Jaipur. It is known as Pink City, right? Because most of the houses are pink in color. So that can be an example of a folk architecture, as well, where most of the houses are, you know, uh, are said to have a common color. So that's about uh, folk um, architecture. Now, let's talk about folk costumes, right? Folk costumes are also interesting, isn't it? You may have come across a lot of uh, traditional wares. For example, um, you know, the MDH uh, masala person, right? The person wears a pagdi there. Uh, the sardars wear turbans and uh, the Muslim la ladies wear parda. These are examples of some folk costumes that we have, a traditional costume that we have. Let's let's quickly read it verbatim. The dress of all traditional ethnic, occupational and sectarian groups that is determined geographically and expresses the region or the locality comes under this category wow look at the let's look at the definition this is so interesting the dress of all traditional so it includes traditional tradition uh ethnicity ethnicity is you know you belong to one particular race uh not race uh, but a particular community occupational right if you are doing a particular occupation your costume could vary as well. Sectarian is different sect or a section uh, uh, that is determined geographically, which means your region comes into play as well, right? Which part of the country you belong to and expresses the region or the locality, right? Uh, comes under this category. This can also be different for different sects and religions we have already established, right? For example, the Muslim ladies wear pada. And Sardars wear a turban, particular art. You know, we have a lot of folk costumes as well. So that's about that. And the folk cookery, that is again, um, you know, let's 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 talk about folk cookery now. This can be defined as traditional domestic cookery marked by regional variation. Right? It could vary from region to region, but What's common is the traditional domestic cookery that we have. It is opposite of commercial and institutional cookery, right? So, for example, the the modern tools and equipments that we use to cook it is different from you know from the traditional way of cooking. This includes the study of food themselves, their composition, their preparation, their preservation, social and psychological functions. It also includes attitudes, taboo and food habits as well, right? So a lot of, I'm sure, you know, it's it's not a rocket science to know that our food habits also depends on the region. For example, um, you know, if you live um, perhaps in a, in a dry region where you have deserts or where uh, the vegetation is less, chances are very high that People depend on animal meat. And in certain cases, the animal meat is preserved as well, right? So that 
it remains and it can be consumed uh, you know for a longer duration so that can be an example of folk cookery as well the dry fish that we have that can be an example of that right so that's that let's talk about the third section which is a social folk custom right the first one was a oral literature the second one was a material literature uh, material culture and the third part is a social folk custom in between the oral culture and material culture lie areas of traditional life that we may call social folk custom so somewhere you know uh, where social folk custom find its place is it's it's somewhere in midway between the oral literature and the material culture that we have right this is based on group interactions rather than individual skills and performances this is how it is different so the social folk custom is more or less uh, associated with group interaction and less at a one on one level or an individual level uh the first thing the first sub genre in social folk custom is celebrations and festivals who doesn't like celebrations and festivals right so uh let's talk about them almost all societies periodically set aside some time for celebrations these are moments of special significance to the entire community they can be seasonal anniversaries of historical events birth or death of a hero uh, or god or religious insignificance they might be moments in which some uh, some living or dead person is honored with feasting and some performance as well right this is self explanatory so you know there could be seasonal for example um you know the bhogi that we have the baisakhi uh, the bihu these are all seasonal right they uh, you know that they, they mark a new beginning or the it's a harvest festival which is seasonal it doesn't happen every month right um on the other hand some other moments of special significance could be anniversaries of uh, historical events as well for example independence day or other uh, significance that uh, significant events that we have right so um so that's about celebrations and festivals recreation and games this is a form of expressive behavior and can be non productive in nature <laughs> i like it 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 clearly states non productive in nature right this is separated from reality and goals are in it which means you for example in the, the modern games that we have we have level 1 level 2 and we have some numbers associated with it as well right some you know you win so many points perhaps that's what they're trying to hint here uh, may not be in the same form and structure but some element where the, there's a particular goal uh, here the main idea behind the game is recreation and pleasure many folklorists have paid attention uh traditional games and many folklorists have paid attention traditional games and uh, past times can you think of uh, you know one of the traditional games uh, which which comes to your mind i mean something that comes to, to my mind is uh, you know the game which shakuni mama plays in mahabharat right i think that can be a part of uh, the game as well i don't recall the name of the game um right if you do, do remember do uh, mention that in 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 the comment box so that can be an example and the sap cd the snake and the ladder game that we have as well right i was watching one of uh, you know uh, videos about the origin of the snake and ladder and let me tell you that it's not just for fun and recreation it was some rishi who started it right i mean it was not as simple as we see today but it had different levels of complication but the snake and ladder game that we uh, see today that's a simplified version of it and of the of the game i'm talking about but that's an example that could be an example of recreation and games as well folk medicine folk medicine this consists of natural or herbal folk medicines and magical religious folk medicines so you see there are two categories let me repeat this consists of natural or herbal folk medicines and magical religious folk medicines in the former uh, which mean they're talking about the natural one cure is sought from herbs 
plants, minerals, and animal substances, while the latter, which is the magical religious folk, religious folk, attempts at attempts at curing through charms, through charms, holy words, and actions. Right? Uh, I'm sure a lot of us we would have gone through this where we chant a particular thing, or a, uh, you know a, a a particular phrase or a mantra, right? Those could be examples of uh, magical religious folk medicines. In other words, occultism. Ayurveda is one such popular form of folk medicine as well. So it comes under this category of folk uh, medicine. Um, I'm not sure how many of you watch this uh, movie called Dhamman. It's a, it's an Odia movie. It has uh, more than I think the IMDb rating that we have is 9.6 if i you know if my memory serves me right and the why am i talking about that it's dubbed in hindi as well why am i talking about that is in this movie uh, daman there's a lot of this show a lot of how this uh, local um, you know uh, tantrics and all they use this magical religious folk medicines right instead of uh, you know giving them treating them with either herbal folk medicine they they there's a lot of example there and i thought this is relevant to this context that that's why i've quoted uh, the name of the movie here there's no other purpose behind quoting <laughs> this example so that's folk medicine uh, and folk religion these are orally this folk religion is one more subcategory these are orally transmitted popular beliefs amongst people this recognizes one or more deity, spirits, and demons, personal and impersonal power, ghosts, fate, luck, and music. Sorry, not music, magic. In this, rationalism and science makes very little in fact. In fact, the same movie, the movie, uh, you know, Dhamman that I uh, spoke about, there is an exact, th these are the exact things uh, shown in the movie and how the doctor comes and um, you know fights for the people and shows them how these things may not be of help and you know um, and does his bit. So folk religion could be examples of again let me repeat um, you know this recognizes one or more deities, spirits, demons, personal and impersonal power, ghosts, uh, fate, luck and magic in this rationalism which means rationalism and science make very little impact right so um, all these beliefs take over science they also embrace the attitudes behaviors and cultural values of people right so that's that and the last section that we have right we've already covered the oral section the material section um and then the social folk section and this is the last section which is performing folk art. Wow. These are conscious presentations by individuals or group with folk instruments, dance, costumes, and props. Some of its subgenres are discussed below. The folk drama that we have, right? Uh, these are, they are performances that occur in festivals and rituals. Now, each and every state, each and every region have their own, you know, folk dramas. And it's especially in India, it's never ending. And, uh, you know, it's an ocean in itself. And come to think of it, isn't isn't this great about our country that we live in? All right. Uh, they, they use conventional symbols such as masks and costumes and the performing and the performance takes place through styled actions, right? Not, you know, styled actions would mean not, not the, the way we behave in day-to-day -day life, right? Uh, it is essentially a public performance and is easily understood by the audience. They often use many techniques such as dancing, singing, bombastic speeches to attract the audience. I mean, one of the things that I can think of is the Ram Leela that we see Right in different uh, in, in different parts and almost uh, in, in every part of the country. Or if it's not Ram Leela, I'm sure it has a different name to it. Right, those are examples of the folk dramas that we have. Uh, wow, um, it generally um, you know there's there's a place called um, Ganjam. There's a district called Ganjam in Odisha. 
and every two years there's a there's a jatra that happens now jatra is what we'll talk about in uh, for, you know other sections as well but this is relevant to this uh, context of folk drama so that happens for a month or so where uh, they pray a particular you know a deity and a lot of folk dramas happen so you you know uh, the ramlila happens and one of the other popular thing happens is the hiranyakashyap uh, episode that happens that is very popular um, right and uh, people wait in ramayana also happens and people wait to watch that scene where uh, lakshman cuts the nose of uh, supernaka right and trust me i have i've seen this myself and people literally wait for supernaka's nose to be cut <laughs> so those those are examples of folk drama and um, right if you think if you you know i, I just quoted examples of what i know uh, if you think that there are many more i'm sure there are many more do mention in the comment box as well and let's let's spread the knowledge that we have right so that's about folk drama and folk music this is all traditional music and is orally transmitted and passed down by ear and performed by memory right which means it's not written right uh, right from you know uh, from the birth of a particular kid or a particular com community they listen to it and pass on to the next generation it is not written down and also does not have any musical score right which means um, you know it, it doesn't have many instruments right uh, the origin of music largely remains unknown which means we don't know where it started from right like like already mentioned it has been passed down from generations to generations the origin of this is anonymous essentially that's what we're trying to uh, trying to say here it can get highly diffused as it passes down uh, from one individual to another right because there's a lot of generations and people involved so it, the, the original music might get diffused as well which is why we we come across multiple versions of the same you know same song right come to think of it any particular song uh, you know or a particular music you'll find different versions of it right? and and this is exactly one of the reasons folk music wow and i think i'm talking about folk music i must mention the rajasthani folk music which is very popular uh, and i'm sure you know it, it's not just rajasthani music each and every region has its own particular folk music uh, right which is equally popular as well so folk music that's about your folk music do name a few folk music that you particularly like in the comment box uh, and then folk dance right this is again very interesting a traditional anonymously chore choreographed dance which means we don't know who has choreographed it right a traditionally anonymously choreographed dance that is communally derived can be called folk dance that is communally derived which means which is derived from a particular community right it has strong regional or local characteristics it is usually expressed vernacularly vernacular is you know the local language and is often a product of change and innovation right the example that i spoke about the thakurani jatra that happens in ganjam that's very unique to you know ganjam district in odisha there and uh, the folk dance right one why i'm talking about that again is uh, there is a particular dance the it's called as bagho nacho right bagho is bag the tiger and nacho is nach uh, or dance right so every two years this happens and uh, people like men right people uh, you know they literally uh, dress themselves as uh, tigers right when i say dress they paint themselves as tigers they use a you know like a big mask of uh, tigers and the dance and i think this is i mean and other i've also watched in other uh, you know clippings or uh, something similar in other regions of the country as well but that can be example of a folk dance and i'm sure that is one of the examples that i quoted there are multiple multiple folk dances uh, right wow so that's that with this we have come to an end of genres right and let me just summarize we've gone through 
the oral literature, the material culture, the social folk customs, and the performing uh, folk arts. I hope you enjoyed this session today. I mean, um, you know, I enjoyed, I think, I must say that out of all the sessions, I have personally liked this this one because I can relate to I can I can you know the all the senses the the sense organs you know we may have seen it we may have felt it and which is why I relate to this particular uh, lecture or podcast the most do do share your comments and thoughts you know in in the in the comment box. So that's that. And with that, I must also say that we are done with unit one, which means uh, folklore issues and methods. The block one is done with, with this podcast or lecture. So I will see you soon in the next uh, podcast and lecture. And let's continue to enjoy this journey together. All right. So... Enjoy the rest of your day or your evening and I will see you soon, right? Take care. Bye-bye.